At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Hello and welcome to this new Drug Science Podcast. Today's topic is decriminalization. And with me today, I have two real experts in the field. One from very early in the morning over in the USA, Sheila Vakaria from Brooklyn, from the, uh, the Drug Policy Alliance in the States, and our very own Alex Stevens from the uh, University of Kent. Sheila is Deputy Director of the Department of Academic Engagement, and Alex is Professor of Criminal Justice, which he tells me is not to be confused with being a professor of criminology. They're much more elite, and many fewer of them, but they both work in the same field. And uh, welcome to you both. Thank you for joining up in this podcast today. Thank you so much for having us. It's going to be interesting. So, Sheila, let's say, let's start with you since you're our overseas guest. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself and your background and, and also a bit about Drug Policy Alliance, please. Sure. So my training is actually in social work and clinical social work. Before I got my PhD, I actually worked as service provider at a addiction treatment facility in the United States and worked in a very traditional setting where many of my clients were involved with the justice or the legal system in some way, coerced into treatment and care, and really entrenched in kind of the criminalization of drug use. After spending a little bit of time there, I ended up moving to be a clinical social worker at a needle exchange in New York City and kind of got a chance to really see the breadth of the kinds of services that I could offer, but really came around to the idea that we didn't need to coerce and mandate people for help when we were giving them the kinds of help that they needed. And so really my passion for harm reduction grew as a result of my clinical work, um, working with people where they were at. And it was doing that work that I eventually was moved to, to get my PhD in social welfare and really to think of myself as someone who could bridge the connect between how drug and alcohol use and addiction and treatment was conceptualized in the field of, of social work and how we can become better providers, but also how social work could potentially lead the cause of thinking of a different way of thinking about drug use. Um, so for a number of years, I was a faculty member teaching addiction counseling with a harm reduction lens for social work students before the Drug Policy Alliance offered me a position I couldn't refuse. So I'm at the Drug Policy Alliance now. We are the leading drug policy advocacy organization in the United States that works to end the war on drugs. And that can look like a lot of things. It means that we are at the forefront of addressing marijuana or cannabis policy reform because in the United States, marijuana enforcement continues to be the leading driver of criminalization around drug use in, in, in our country. But we also are working to expand policies informed by harm reduction that help keep people who continue to use drugs safe. So that looks like syringe access legislation, trying to open the first legally sanctioned safer consumption space, and a variety of other kind of policy initiatives. And then lastly, broader justice reform and reform in the legal criminal legal system. And one of the most exciting wins that we recently had was decriminalization in Oregon. My role at the Drug Policy Alliance is really to make sure that we are staying abreast of the cutting edge research as it relates to our policy advocacy agenda. And so I spend a lot of time keeping an eye on the research, keeping an eye on who is producing the best research that is most relevant to our work and finding ways to give those academics platforms to share their research, but also making sure that we at DPA are able to articulate how our, how our policy agenda is actually grounded in evidence. So um, that's my introduction. It's interesting. So the DPA is like an American mirror of, of drug science then. Maybe you've been going for longer. How long has DPA been going? In its current form, we have been in existence for about 20 years, although some of the kind of earlier manifestations of our work uh, predated that. But we'd say in its current form, about 20 years. Cool. And we've been going, it feels like 20, but I think it's only 12. 
Right, thank you. And uh, so let's, uh, Alex, introduce yourself and explain to us uh, why you're in this field of criminal justice policy. Well, similar to Sheila, I started out by being involved in service provision. In my case, I was working for a charity called Prisoners Abroad, which provided advice, information and support to British people who were imprisoned in other countries. And many of my clients were imprisoned in other countries because of being involved in the traffic of drugs, normally you know, reasonably small, but still significant amounts of cannabis at the French border, for example, ecstasy pills coming in from the Netherlands. And that got me interested in why we're imprisoning people. What's the point of spending all that money and wasting all that human capital? And so I got into working on the research side. And so I've been researching the overlap between drugs, crime and public health for about 25 years now. And I've done quite a lot of projects on and with people who are being criminalised for their use of drugs. It's always seemed to me rather pointless to try and deter people from doing something we think is harmful by imposing more harms upon them. So I started looking at the evidence on that and didn't find much evidence that that was an effective approach. Indeed, I completed a review a couple of years ago um, with some colleagues for the Irish government on alternatives to criminalisation for simple possession of drugs. And in that, we found very little evidence that criminalisation helps people or deters them from using drugs. But some evidence from several countries around the world that have um, introduced alternatives such as decriminalisation, that when it's combined with effective services, um, when we stop imposing arbitrary punishments on people, we can see better outcomes for those people and also for public health. And um, the most famous example, I suppose, is Portugal, which I researched with my colleague Caitlin Hughes and found that after they combined decriminalisation, not just of cannabis, but of all drugs for personal use with the public health approach and investment in harm reduction services, they saw a substantial reduction in drug-related deaths, HIV infections related to injecting drug use, and not, not much evidence of the feared increase that people said would happen in drug use once you decriminalised. So you teach a course at the University of Kent, do you? You, you have students who learn about criminal I, justice? I teach undergraduate po some postgraduates. I teach social research methods. I teach a module on drugs and crime. I have several postgraduates who are interested in these these issues. Cool. So back to you, Sheila. So you you started off in social work, and then you you said you got interested in harm reduction. But presumably at that time it was still a, a dirty word, wasn't it? I thought the Americans weren't allowed to talk about harm reduction. Or was that a myth uh, that, that we we get taught? Some would argue we still can't really talk about it in the United States. <laughs> so absolutely. I mean, I'd say that we've we've come a long way yet. I think as a nation, there's still so much farther that we can come along. And absolutely. I mean, there are states in the United States where syringe service programs are considered illegal. And there are states where syringes are criminalized still. And that syringe service are offer, often op, like working and operating in a legal gray area and allowed to function. We also know that on a federal level, in terms of federal funding for harm reduction, there has been uh, historically uh, some serious limits on what they will fund. Uh, there's some promise that perhaps with some of the legislation that's now coming out and being passed in light of COVID, that we may actually for the first time see some federal funding for harm reduction programming for the first in our history, but typically harm reduction programming has had to be funded purely by grant funding, by local or state funding, or through donations and those sorts of things. So arguably harm reduction continues to be relatively stigmatized, although I think our current overdose crisis has shifted some of the broader discourse. But So was it ever illegal to pursue harm reduction, or was it that there was no funding from the feds or from the state, so you had to do it through charity, whether you were actually breaking the law to do it. So there are states in which there are currently people providing syringe service programs that are under, like underground and are operating illegally in states that are not really? sanctioned for providing wow. syringes, no absolutely. Mm -hmm. There are a number of states where you cannot legally access sterile syringes if they are not being used for medical purposes with a prescription. So that is truly still a concern in this country. And we continue to see HIV and hepatitis C outbreaks. We continue to see overdose outbreaks. And we continue to see the health of people who use drugs continue to deteriorate in those communities as a result of our policies. So, you know, even though we are a nation of 50 states, in a lot of ways, 50 states operate very independently from one another. And the policy landscape on a state level can, can really 
demonstrate the breadth of the kinds of policy environments that people are living in, in terms of having access or not having access, being at risk of a, uh, of arrest versus being able to access services and safety. So yeah, the US is quite a spread. So fighting on 50 fronts is a challenge. I guess that's why you'd like the federal laws to change, because then this, would the states be compelled to fall in line? Well, oftentimes uh, states are operating sometimes with the fear of federal intervention when they are when they do pass legislation that may be slightly that may not be addressed on a federal level. For instance, you know, cannabis or marijuana is a federally scheduled substance. And technically, the states that have passed legalization, both medical and adult use, are in violation of federal law. Yet there's been a kind of, you know, implicit understanding that the federal government has bigger problems. However, what on one clear example in which this has been a challenge is in conversations about opening the first legally sanctioned safer consumption space in the United States. What we've seen is that local jurisdictions have been having conversations. It's even made it to the state level in certain situations. However, just in the past several years, the closest that we were moving forward was in the in the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. An institution called Safe House was going to be moving forward with the first legally sanctioned safer consumption space. And that was a moment where we actually saw the federal government come in and bring a case against the community in saying that the safer consumption space that they were trying to open is going to violate a federal uh, statute, which is uh, unfortunately known as the so-called crack house statute, a statute that was passed actually um, under someone who is now our current president, <laughs> Joseph Biden, a statute that was passed with the intention of deterring individuals from running locations where it was known that people would be taking substances. And the federal government has stepped in and said that that safer consumption spaces are similar to running a so-called crack house. And I think, Alex, that's exactly the same problem in the UK, isn't it? It's exactly the same law. Is it called the crack house? It's not called a crack house law. It was the den, opium den laws. <laughs> exactly. It was a, a, a much an older law targeted at previous places where people gathered to consume a substance that the government didn't like them consuming. And it's still acting as a barrier to um, the opening of safer consumption spaces, as are the laws which we have in place against the use, the, the distribution of paraphernalia. So we have got around that law in terms of distributing safer injecting equipment but it still creates a barrier for things like distributing um, crack pipes that would be safer for people to use than the ones they're repeatedly using and sharing so there are very similar barriers at these uk level compared to the federal level in usa that prevent us from doing better harm reduction services I should just give a little plug to drug science here. We are, we are actively, with Alex's help, in case he doesn't tell you, trying to work out whether we can find a way around this issue for a safe ejecting, self -con safe consumption room. You probably all know that uh, there's a mobile one in Scotland, and uh, I interviewed Peter, Peter Cryant on this um, one of these podcasts so recently. We'd like to do the same in England and Wales, and uh, and Alex is leading the drug science group that's trying to work out how we can do that. And uh, I'm right behind you there, Alex. But getting back to the, but Britain was a, we've been ahead of the game in other areas, haven't we? I mean, so we did at least allow the introduction of uh, of needle exchange. Do you want do you want to comment a little bit on? on this rather patchy history of British drug policy than over the last 50 years. Yeah, the UK was a global leader in, in harm reduction services during the HIV epidemic of the 80s and 90s. Based on the evidence, the Advisory Council on Misuse of Drugs put out a very important report in 1988 on AIDS and drug misuse. And it was accepted at that time that it was more important that people's lives be saved by effective harm reduction services such as needle exchanges and methadone maintenance treatment than it was important for the government to signal its disapproval of drug use. And so under the Thatcher government, it was possible to have some reasonably enlightened um, harm reduction policies that were put in place in the UK which were very effective and one of the reasons today that the UK has still has much lower rates of HIV infection amongst injecting drug users than for countries for example like the United, the United States is that we've had that long history of effective harm reduction services for people who inject drugs. Yeah it's interesting I mean it's HIV is a bit like Covid when you know when, the, when other people are more obviously potentially affected particularly I guess some um, people who are you know, go anywhere near uh, street users, then they start to get worried about the health implications and viruses, you know, so, you know, we've seen that there's been a, a quite an, a rapid, which might cause sort of reconceptualization of harm reduction in relation to COVID. 
that is fascinating when you think about the motivations of why it was that that actually government improved harm reduction service in the 80s because there's a big perception at the time that hiv would jump from the population of people who are injecting drugs to people who are having sex with each other and that fear of hiv infecting what were thought of as being normal people saw a much greater response than we're currently seeing to the drug related death crisis in the uk we have over we have record levels of drug related deaths over 4000 people dying a year but that's a group that is not seen as being in contact with the normal population and not being at that the normal population is not at risk from dying with overdoses of heroin combined with benzodiazepines and alcohol and so there's much less urgency in the response to the drug death crisis we're seeing now than there was the hiv crisis of the 80s yeah, so that's right. So if we could kind of get get it so that COVID was coming in through that route, we would probably have limitless resources. Well, let's not wish for that. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's an interesting point. Yes. Well, I suppose I'm touching on this point that you two both in your whole career have been very intimately close to, which is the concept of drug users as being somehow diff so different that you can't talk about them in the same breath as normal people. When, of course, as the three of us know, this is just truly one of the the worst examples of labeling and stigma and projection there's ever been and, it, and i guess that injustice is what motivates both of you would you agree with that sheila absolutely i mean i think that it is human to want to pursue altered states i think that humans pursue altered states through a variety of, of means, whether it's through consumption of various substances, but whether it's seeking out certain experiences, and many people just endogenously have altered states and experiences and learn how to manage and live life with them. And I think, you know, there is something about the war on drugs, as we call it at my organization, and many people kind of colloquially call it, that really has, you know, sought out to stigmatize and highly select which types of altered states, which altered states inducing compounds or substances are, are thereby seen as stigmatized, but then also the decision to not only make it about the substance, but somehow also dig deep into the public and community psyche about the most stigmatized people who already existed. And in the United States, we can talk about xenophobia and racism being deeply entrenched in our drug policies. And the ways in which we've Kind of conflated this stigmatization of a substance with you know groups of people who were already socially excluded or socially at the margins or stigmatized and the way that that's really complicated things because again when you look at who is criminalized and who's incarcerated it's not even that we're necessarily pursuing everyone who uses every substance because we know that we have a fragmented system in which some people already de facto are engaging in decriminalized slash potentially legalized use and who do not have to fear for the involvement of the justice system. In the United States, we have some of the highest rates of drug use, and I'm not even talking about necessarily problematic drug use, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, the vast majority mm -hmm. of Americans can say that they've used an illicit substance, and marijuana is one of the most commonly used illicit substances, and our jails and prisons are not full of that segment of the population. It's a very specific segmented portion of the population who we see actually bearing the brunt of criminalization. And I've often wondered, is that racism or is it just politics just that you prosecute people that don't vote anyway so they you kind of don't lose any votes by prosecuting them or is it some combination of the two i call racism racism when i see it and so i don't necessarily see where you know i mean sure it's about votes but in the united states it's also that we've chosen that we you know dis voter disenfranchisement is a key part of our justice and legal system but i would say it's more about social control and i think it's more about you know social stratification uh, maintaining social hierarchies maintaining you know, a certain form of social order. And I think this is a relic, a relic of slavery in the United States in the ways in which even what we call our criminal legal system or our justice system has roots in what was our historic slave patrols. Like when we think about why law enforcement, so-called law enforcement exists in its current form, it has roots in um, the early days of enslavement in this country. And when Black people were eventually freed and the ways in which, you know, white communities continue to need to have some means of controlling black communities, but also other migrant communities that had come and settled in this country. But I suppose that's somewhat different in the UK, would you would you say, Alex? I wouldn't say it was that different. I mean, look at the history of our drug policy. It's profoundly colonial. Right. We got involved 
in drug policy, first of all, this is this is a forgotten history for many people. Many of my students are surprised to hear about the opium wars yes. and to hear that we used to fight wars with foreign powers in order to enforce that they would have a legal market for opium. Yeah. So from the birth of our drug policy, it's been about colonial power. The 1868 Pharmacy Act was an exercise in class power with a particular professional group claiming control of the most powerful analgesics that were on the market at the time on the basis of a class argument that working class people weren't able to control their own drug use yeah. and so had to be controlled. And so the history of, of drug control in the United States and the UK is a history of social control of marginalised groups, including working class people and black people. And one thing we do have in common as well as that is the fact that we both countries now have a significant problem with opioid deaths. So let's move back to Sheila. So uh, I'm really interested in your uh, take on what, what's happened, how it all went so wrong. And, and then we'll come back to you later as to what to do about it. So tell me about what's your take on the history, the legacy of the last, say, two decades and, and the rise of opiate deaths? Yeah, so I mean, just to give you a snapshot of where we are as a nation right now in terms of our overdose crisis, you know, as the most recent estimates that we have access to is that the 12-month calendar period of May of 2019 until May of 2020 uh, involved 80,000 deaths due to drug overdose. And, you know, we we get our data incrementally. And so, you know, as data gets ac you know more accessible and cleaned up, we will have a calendar year. But that 12-month period of May to May is the most recent data that we have accessible. And it was uh, upwards of 80,000 overdose deaths. And over 60% or around 60% of those involved illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And one of the interesting trends that we have seen, even just in the past two years, is that this framing of an opioid crisis has actually started to become a bit of a misnomer in the sense that just as of this past two years, the next two commonly involved drugs in overdose deaths on a national scale are cocaine and methamphetamine. On a national scale, actually heroin and prescription opioid involved overdose deaths have hit a plateau in the past several years. And that trend line actually has them as the fourth and fifth most commonly involved drugs in overdose deaths nationally. With, you know, illicitly manu manufactured fentanyl is number one, cocaine and methamphetamine is number two, and then those is four, um, uh, two and three, and then the other opioids as four and five. And so one of the things that we have been talking about in the United States is that this has been an overdose crisis that has un unfolded in waves. Right. So this crisis has, has been in existence for roughly around 20 years, depending on who you talk to. And over the course of those 20 years, we've seen shifting trends in which drugs were most commonly involved in deaths right, on a national scale. So we marked kind of the early years by the, you know, the increased involvement of prescription opioids. But then right around, you know, 2008 to 2012, 14, we really saw heroin starting to kind of take over in its involvement. And then by 2014, especially here on the East Coast of the United States, because fentanyl emerged uh, regionally first, the, the fentanyl wave of the overdose crisis started to unfold in about 2014. But simultaneously, within one or two years of that fentanyl wave kind of hitting, we also began to see a steep rise in cocaine and methane involved overdose, which many of us are coining now the fourth wave of the overdose crisis, the stimulant wave of the overdose crisis. But I'd be interested in what's your sort of analysis of why those waves came? So um, there, there are a number of theories to kind of to talk about, to understand, to conceptualize and to frame the crisis. I think you know, if we think about traditional supply and demand policies in terms of drivers of various phenomena and also in terms of solutions, but also challenges and unintended consequences, you know, I think the the involvement of the pharmaceutical industry and uh, various large pharmaceuticals in the proliferation of, of access to prescription opioids, I think is a well-known kind of framing that, that many people speak to and that perhaps had its relevance, but for very short period of time in this broader context. And I think, unfortunately, it's a narrative that continues to persist, even though the phenomena has really changed over time. And we are now in the point where we are dealing with the collateral consequences of all of the ways in which our policies in the pendulum swung completely the other way. And our policy responses have now led to a very different kind of set of circumstances, right? So one of the things that really unfolded after the framing of this crisis as being driven by big pharma, as we call them in the United States, was that we immediately moved to pushing for abuse deterrent formulations of opioids, meaning opioids that would take longer 
for their effects to, to kick in in a way to deter people from crushing and snorting and feeling immediate effects. What we also saw was that some policy, some supply side policies that also took place were the advent of something called prescription drug monitoring programs, something that we refer to as PDMPs. These allowed the Drug Enforcement Agency to get access to controlled substance prescriptions across the United States. Out of the 50 states, 49 states have any some form of PDMP in which the federal government and our Drug Enforcement Agency can access the records of medical patients who are being prescribed controlled substances. This was in an attempt to address what was framed as doctor shopping, a phenomenon of patients seeking multiple doctors for multiple faulty scripts, but also this idea that the people who were overdosing were pain patients. Again, this conception that the overprescription to an indicated patient was leading those indicated patients to die led to these abuse deterrent formulations, but also controlling those patients. But unfortunately, one of those false assumptions, it, it turned out to be a false assumption because most of the people who ended up dying of overdose were not the indicated patient for which these substances were prescribed, but were often friends and family members who had acquired the, the prescription from someone else's legitimate prescription. And if someone had started using problematically, they were only using from one doctor's prescription. So again, some of these policy responses that we started to develop were based in some ground of reality, but they were also framed with certain misconceptions. And what we found was that all of a sudden, going from a pendulum of free and, and relatively easy access for some communities for these prescription opioids, that we all of a sudden swung the pendulum the other way creating suspicion between doctors and patients. Is this a drug-seeking patient? Patients not, not being able to advocate for their own health and medical needs with providers, knowing that opioids sometimes work best for them, but also not really acknowledging the social determinants of health that were driving overdose deaths in the communities where numbers went up, right? So understanding that there were, you know, economically disadvantaged communities, communities in which access to healthcare and access to other kinds of treatments for pain were non-existent, so that unfortunately throwing a pill at the problem was part of the solution, and a variety of other factors, right? Because drug use is a complicated phenomenon that occurs within the broader context of people's lives. And what we saw was that we saw the shifting markets towards illicit heroin because it was easier to access because our drug supply chains were already starting to respond to uh, increased demand and it was harder for them to supply prescription opioids. So heroin took over. And what we know is that, you know, you can read the works of Valetsky and Davis, their seminal paper, you know, the Iron Law of Prohibition and how fentanyl emerged in our markets to really talk about how quickly our markets also had to adapt to increased demand, but also increased enforcement and uh, supply seizures that, that came into play. And what we can say is that you know, stimulant-involved overdose has really increased in recent years, partially because we've noticed that stimulant supplies have become actually more potent, cheaper, and more pure than they have been historically. And what we're hearing from a lot of people who use opioids is that long-term opioid users, many of whom were not polysubstance users, not users of stimulants of any kind, are now mixing as a way to combat and counteract some of the harsh and strong potent effects of the opioids on the market right or in the illicit market right now and so we're hearing a lot of users talk about how they're using meth to offset the stronger effects of fentanyl or sometimes when their market is so infiltrated by fentanyl they're actually using meth to tide themselves over and although it's a completely different process it's the way that they're managing withdrawal i don't know if that's answering your question i mean i could continue what to go on but no, I mean, it's interesting. Pharmacologically, it makes sense. But it is, it's a bit like driving your car with your, your foot flat on the accelerator and the brake simultaneously. You know, the complete opposite pharmacology is the counteract, but very, very unstable. If, yeah. you know, if something go, either goes wrong, you're really in shook. But back to you, Alec. I mean, because in Britain, we've got the highest number of opioid deaths ever as well, but from different reasons. Would you agree? Yes, different reasons. Partly, Thankfully, there's less uh, fentanyl and other very powerful opioids on the market. But we have seen a dramatic rise in drug-related deaths since 2012, which is partly related to the end of what was known as the heroin drought. In 2010 to 2012, there was a shortage of heroin in the West, in Western Europe, including in the UK, and people found it hard to get heroin. Um, there was moving, people moving towards methadone rather than using heroin. Uh, since then, the, the supplies bounced back, the prices have gone down, the purity-adjusted price certainly has gone down uh, because people can get purer heroin more easily 
and also there's been an increase in supply of cocaine and pure cocaine into the uh, British market. So the partly markets have changed. Also, there's an issue which, with which is what's known as the aging cohort, a group of people who started using heroin in the 80s and 90s under Thatcher when there was deindustrialization, mass unemployment, people and, and the arrival of new brown heroin into the British heroin market. People got into heroin at that time and heroin is a very sticky substance. People tend to stay with it a long time if they've got a problem with it. And those people become more vulnerable to health problems or variety of health problems, including overdose as they age. And a lot of the attention policy-wise has been placed on this aging cohort, as if that's the only reason that we've got, that we should blame people for getting older, and somehow that justifies the fact that they're dying in large numbers in their 40s and 50s. I don't think that's humane or effective. And it also ignores what else has been going on, which is that the government's been cutting money for drug treatment services. And so as part, not only in terms of direct funding for drug treatment services themselves, but also all the other services that local authorities provide that have been cut away through the politics of austerity and cut away hardest in the places that need it most. Those places like Blackpool, for example, which is the place in England which has by far the highest rate of drug-related deaths, is also the council area that's experienced the, the most significant cuts to its funding of incomes of people and of the local authority in the area. So exactly the opposite policy mix of what you'd want to do when you've got increasing heroin supply, increasingly vulnerable population, what you'd want to do is to get more of those people into treatment and provide more social and welfare support to keep people away from problematic drug use. What we've done is the opposite and push people towards exclusion, to away from services that can help them and reduce their risks of death. Hi, it's David Nutt here again. I want to take a moment to thank all of the drug science community members. In a world of paid sponsorships, political and commercial interference, Drug science is and always will be independent. If you value the show as an educational resource and want to help keep us going, you can do so at drugscience.org.uk. Without our community, the dissemination of unbiased information would not be possible. By becoming a drug science community member, you help to create a world where drug control is rational and evidence-based, where drug use is better informed and drug users are understood, where drugs are used to heal, not harm. Furthermore, by becoming a premium community member, you will receive a signed copy of my autobiography, access to exclusive events. At the end of the season, we will be hosting an exclusive Q&A podcast episode with all of our premium community members, where you can ask me anything. You can find out how to do this in the show notes. So now, thank you, and back to the show. I was wondering, can I jump in for a second? So one of the other things, thank you, Alex, for kind of providing that framing that I think is really important for us to think about as well when we think about these waves of the overdose crisis is the demographic of, of who's dying and who's most impacted. And absolutely, we have also seen a shift in terms of the, the demographic of folks who are aging or who, who are dying, one of which including people who are aging, who are middle class or middle class, middle aged or older, but also the racial and ethnic composition of, of those who are decedents, but also their uh, place of residence. So whereas the early days of the framing of this overdose crisis were predominantly rural or suburban, were young, were white, what we're seeing is in recent years that the overdose crisis has actually disproportionately impacted communities of color. And between 2017 and 2018, we actually saw the white overdose death rate decrease but we saw an increase among Black and Latinx communities. And for the past several years, the overdose death rate has increased among Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities in the United States. And there hasn't been a space for this in the broader discourse. So, you know, whereas our broader narratives are still kind of entrenched in prescription opioids, young, white, rural users, you know, this actual demographic shift has become one that is more urban, one that is a little bit older, one that is among communities of color, and one that is increasingly involving illicitly manufactured fentanyl, but also stimulants. And our broader narrative has had no space for this, but also our policy responses have really failed. One of the things that we've seen is that while there has been increased funding for access to buprenorphine and increased training for buprenorphine in the United States as, as a medication for opioid use disorder, is that we see stark racial disparities in who has access. So increasing amounts of research have come out suggesting that doctors are actually prescribing communities of color buprenorphine at 70% lower rates than they are to white patients. 
And part of this is a broader framing of how we as a country have conceptualized methadone dispensing versus buprenorphine dispensing and the ways in which they've become tools of social control, but also perhaps liberation for some communities that use opioids who are deemed capable and trustworthy and able to take home a 28-day dose of buprenorphine. And so one of the other failures of, of our policy responses has been we've supposedly made these blanket new recommendations. We've tried to increase access to treatment without an, a, a framework of equity and understanding that fundamentally our health systems are racist and do provide disproportionate care to white communities and that disenfranchise, that, that actually cut off access to communities of color. And so unfortunately, one of the problems that we're seeing is that as long as we have these policy solutions that are provided in a race neutral way, communities of color are going to continue to lose out on access unless we truly fold in equity into our policies, increasing the number of providers of color. We know that when you are the same race as your provider, unfortunately, you get better care in this country. And we know that we need more providers who are from the communities that they're providing services to, that are providing it in culturally competent ways, that are going to communities where they live and increasing access and tailoring their messages to the communities most impacted. And this is another one of the more troubling characteristics of this fourth wave, is the ways in which we're decimating communities of color. And we're already also seeing that if you want to talk about COVID in our COVID response as well, in terms of vaccine distribution and disproportionate impact of the virus. And I think as society, we need to think more broadly of the ways in which racial inequities find their way into the health care provision and also the health and well-being of communities of color. If I could just add to that. Oh, please, Alex. Yeah, well, one of the scandals is that if that were happening in the UK, we wouldn't even know because we're not collecting the data that would allow us to tell us so. So we know very well that there's inequalities in the response to COVID and the, num and the numbers of people who are dying, but we're not collecting data on the ethnicity of people who are dying from drugs or suicide. So we wouldn't know if there was racial inequity in those those death rates. So let's look at a more radical solution then. Okay, we're given that the politicians don't want to invest appropriately in the whole range of uh, necessary interventions, you know, you know both social and, and medical. What about the theme of this uh, podcast, which was decriminalization? So, Alex, do you want to sort of kick off and explain to, explain to the listeners this, the different constructs around decriminalization, legalization, depenalization, just so that we know we're all on the same uh, page, please? Or... Thanks for that opportunity, because these things are often confused with each other, because it's quite confusing. There's a lot of different ways of being different in drug policy, and so we need to be quite careful about how to describe them. Uh, I think the most basic distinction to make is between decriminalisation on one hand and legalisation on the other. And when we're talking about decriminalisation, we're normally talking about taking away the criminal offence of possession of drugs that are otherwise controlled, whereas legalisation normally means allowing the sale and supply of those substances. But even then, we have to think about different ways of avoiding the criminalization of people who are in possession of drugs. And there's other ways of doing it rather than just decriminalizing and taking that criminal offense away. And other countries, for example, have done what we call depenalization, which is leaving the law in place, but just choosing not to enforce the law against certain types of drug users. And that's, for example, we've done that partially in England through the cannabis warning scheme, where people for their first cannabis warning, cannabis possession offence, um, can get just a warning instead of being criminalised. That's a form of depenalisation. Another alternative is what we call diversion, where instead of being sent through the criminal justice system, given a charge and a, a, and a, a criminal conviction, one can be diverted to services for education, treatment or support. Court. And that's something that a few police forces in England are doing. It's being done, for example, in the checkpoint scheme in Durham. It's been done extensively in Australia. Every Australian state has a system for diverting people away from criminalisation for possession. And in some US states, as I'm sure Sheila can testify, um, there are schemes for diversion, such as law enforcement, law enforcement assisted diversion, which started in Seattle. And many US states have now uh, decriminalised the possession of small amounts of cannabis. And one of them has even decriminalised the possession of small amounts of all drugs, which is Oregon, several years after Portugal did something similar in 2001. Sheila, yeah, give us your take on uh, and how you see decriminalisation in the states and how you see the uh, the Oregon vote. Do you think that's going to be some kind of major transition? Is that opening a door to something very fundamental? 
Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about it. You know, we at the Drug Policy Alliance, in partnership with a number of leading coalition groups and advocacy partners in Oregon, were thrilled at our success in Oregon to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of drugs and all drugs. I think that this is a huge step forward for us as a country. As I, I mentioned earlier, you know, we are one nation, but we are 50 states. And oftentimes what this allows us to do is to have policy experimentation on the state level and to be able to, to see what a, a model policy can look like and then decide whether we want to adapt or adjust or replicate that in some way in our own context and environments. And so we are incredibly excited by the prospect of moving forward with decriminalization in Oregon because we're really going to be doing some really important work there. First and foremost, we're actually going to build a more robust treatment continuum of care in the state. Actually, Oregon, out of all states in the union, ranked among the lowest states in terms of access to care and access to a robust treatment system. And so there was a reason why, you know, Oregon seemed like a great place to go because it gave us an opportunity to very much think through what would Portugal look like in the United States? Yes, we don't have nationalized health care. Yes, there are a number of components and things that we have no control over. But one thing we could have control over is developing a more robust treatment infrastructure to provide people with that safety net and access to services, including harm reduction services and medication treatments for opioid use disorder. And so, you know, we are simultaneously going in to try to build coalition and community support continuously on the ground because implementation started as of February 1st, which is very exciting. But to build this robust network of care and to really reflect, like, to, to change the culture of how people view people who use drugs, including how law enforcement treats people who use drugs. One of the things that our preliminary research revealed, and my colleague Tesha Naidu, who will be speaking with you soon, we'll talk about is that some of our preliminary research suggested that if implemented correctly, we could see up to 95% reductions in racial disparities and drug-related arrests in, 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 in the state of Oregon as a result of this, because the United States very clearly has racial disparities in who is prosecuted for drug possession. So not only are we going to be reducing racial disparities, but increasing access to care. So I'm interested, what were the motives for the Oregon voters voting? Can you give us a, a brief perspective on that? Was it to reduce racial disparities? Was it to reduce harms? Tell us what were the key elements making that vote happen? Sure. I mean, I think that my colleague Tesha will be able to answer more of these questions when she speaks with you, but I can I can give you a sense. I mean, I think that first and foremost, one of the things that we had to make sure of was that when we put this ballot measure out, we made sure that treatment was at the forefront of how we called this piece, this ballot initiative and how we framed uh -huh. things. Because I, I think that one of the key things that people need to understand is that that one of the biggest barriers to care and to services is all, often just disinvolvement, but also the lack of a treatment infrastructure. And so two of the things that we did by putting treatment at the forefront of the ballot measure was to first and foremost say, we are investing in treatment, we're gonna increase access, but that also we don't need to use the justice system as the only means for access to care. And unfortunately in the United States, and maybe this, this is happening in other parts of the world, unfortunately we've become so invested in criminalization that we've kind of developed this very strange cognitive paradigm where we actually see getting in trouble as being in access to, to services. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, on the ground, it often has worked that way. And instead of saying that maybe this means that the system is broken, the treatment system is broken, and why do we need to use the back, back door entry through the justice system to get care? We just said maybe we just need to continue to use the, the justice system to access care. So I think that that was also a part of what we were trying to do here is to say that when treatment is accessible, affordable, attractive, and meets people where they're at, people will seek it out. And we don't need to use the, you know, the stick. We can use a carrot. <laughs> you know, we can trust people that when they're offered services that that are attractive and appealing and accessible, that they will make the choices that they need. Well, that's great. I mean, we've been trying to do that in Britain for like fifty years, haven't we, Alex? And completely failed. But do you want to comment on what? <laughs> I'm not sure that we've always always made treatment that accessible. <laughs> for a long time, we had very high waiting lists for drug treatment yes. services, and people who've got a problem with heroin, if you if you, they say they want 
they want help today, it's not much good saying to them, well, yes, we'd like to help you, but come back in five weeks. You need to have a treatment service that's open and accessible at the point of need. And by investing heavily in opioid substitution treatment in the 2000s, we were able substantially to limit um, drug-related deaths. It was estimated by the end of the 2000s, we were saving about 880 lives a year through the expansion in opioid substitution treatment by making it more available to people. We now have a situation in Scotland, for example, where we have quite high waiting lists for people to get into opioid substitution treatment, despite the extremely high rates of drug-related deaths that have been observed in Scotland over the last few years. Now, very recently, the Scottish Government has announced a substantial increase in funding that should be able to bring some of those waiting lists down. But, but despite the fact we do have this idea of an NHS which is free at the point of use and there for us all, it's not always there for people who are using drugs. No, well, I think that one of the problems was the Cameron Government basically took, to, you know, took drug service provisions out of the NHS and put it into social care. And I think that was a, just a, a cynical ploy to reduce funding. But I don't know, would you agree with me? <laughs> I'm not so sure that the funding structures that were in place before were perfect, but I'm not sure that the Lansley reform were the answer to the, to the problem that we had. I think there was a lot more on in terms of how the treatment system was working well or not than just Cameron's cynicism. I think we need to have a comprehensive review of how treatment is provided to people who use drugs. And for example, we have, we've moved away in England from the principles of harm reduction. We've got exactly the same problems in England trying to set up safer drug consumption rooms that we've seen in America. And the principle that we should be meeting people's needs on the basis of what evidence works in meeting those needs and reducing deaths has not been implemented in the UK for quite a while. No. And um, is that why it's so encouraging to hear Sheila say that, that a group of voters, I don't know how many there are, what, what, 20 million or so in Oregon, could actually put, put health as the reason for voting for such a remarkable change in policy? I mean, that's extremely exciting to me. And I mean, it, it kind of, I suppose it also epitomizes the fact that the, the US state approach has allowed a much more rational approach to cannabis. And now you have, you know, 200 million Americans having access to medical cannabis and over 100 million having access to recreational cannabis. And in Britain, our politicians still say it's far too dangerous. And our doctors, our doctors tell us that we're waiting for another thalidomide scandal if we allow medical cannabis. I mean, the whole, you know, it makes us feel so backward here. But so I want you to say a few words about cannabis, Sheila, and about how you feel. You must presumably feel relatively pleased at, uh, of the way you've led the world. In, America has led the world in terms of cannabis. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's exciting to see that we've moved forward so far. But I think, you know, just to add a little bit of <laughs> skepticism to all of these gains, I think we have also through this, you know, policy experimental uh, experimentation process found some real failures and, you know, some real gaps in what this could look like in terms of access, involvement in the industry and, you know, even in what the, the will of the voters are, you know, increasingly, you know, Polling data across the United States suggests that about 66%, two out of three Americans support legalization. Yet when you actually look how legalization was passed on the state level, adult use legalization, only one state passed it through the legislative process. All other states passed it through what is known as ballot measures or referendums, in which when they went to the polling place to vote for their elected officials during that election cycle, they also were able to check a box themselves to just say, yes, I support this legislation or I no, I do not. This is also how Oregon passed decriminalization. We took it straight to the voters. Oregon is a state in which voters can directly on the ballot say, yes, I support this or no, I do not. And so while yes, it's tremendous that we've been able to move forward with legalization, it is still truly sad that there are legislators, elected officials supposed to represent the interests of their voters who are working in states where their own constituents support legalization, yet we find that legislators are not the ones introducing this legislation or actually moving it forward, and that the places where we've seen the victories are unfortunately where voters themselves voted on ballot. So I think that that is um, you know, something that we need to think about more broadly in terms of still the disconnect between what politicians see as viable, politically viable, and where the hearts and minds of voters actually are. I think another big lesson that we've learned is that this 50 state piecemeal approach has limitations because as long as marijuana or cannabis remains federally scheduled, banks cannot write loans and cannot get involved in the industry. And that has 
in and of itself created a stratified industry where people who already had access to startup monies and who were able to enter the industry on day one were disproportionately advantaged, right? And so, you know, this is where racial equity, again, really has to be in front and center of the kinds of legislation that we put forward, making sure to earmark monies to uh, communities of color, women-owned businesses, and formerly arrested or incarcerated people getting access to the industry. Also really deterring what we call vertical integration in the industry, basically seed to sale availability of, of licenses and really stratifying the market so people can come in at different entry points and still be able to, to start up businesses and, and benefit in some way. And one of the last things is, is really racial equity and where tax Dollars go. So one of the things that we're most excited with in terms of passing, proposing the MORE Act, which is our federal piece of descheduling legislation that we at DPA have drafted, in addition to the legislation we're trying to pass in New Mexico and in New York, is having provisions that actual tax revenues are earmarked that be allocated to communities of color and communities that were policed and where disproportionate mm -hmm. law enforcement occurred so that those communities can access resources to invest in themselves. Because the historical disenfranchisement of a community when their young men are charged, prosecuted, and saddled with criminal records means that that is the fragmentation of families, the fragmentation of community resources and structures and systems mm -hmm. that would build the support network of, of these communities where people live. So, you know, another one of the key mm -hmm. lessons that we have learned is thinking about what a reparative policy would look like. What would reparations for decades of disproportionate impact look like for the communities that were most policed who lost? Because it's not just about expunging records. It's not about, it's not just about preventing future incarceration. It's about looking backwards and thinking about how the compounding impact of multiple arrest charges and having an ar arrest record slowly and, and, and silently like took away from communities in a most systematic way that further disadvantaged them. But I mean, I think, yeah, that we're not, excuse me, the first thing that has to happen is to sort of wipe out those, those convictions. Is, is that going to happen? What's your hope? So, that, you know, the tricky thing is that because of the different ballot measures that were passed, some ballot measures were able to be passed that, that allowed for the legal industry. Certain measures were also allowed to include expungement. But there are certain state policies about how many different caveats you can add to a ballot measure. So one of the challenges that we had to do in some states, like, for instance, in California, was we had to go back afterwards to add some of the expungement provisions. And some of the things that we're trying to build into the legislative bills that we're trying to pass is already building expungement in. But absolutely, I think expungement has to be part of it. But then again, we still have to acknowledge that even expungement isn't enough. Because if you were seen as already having a marijuana ticket, the next time you got picked up for a petty larceny or some other effect, you compounded that because of the previous marijuana arrest, right? So you were harsh, more harshly sentenced for every other offense. So again, erasing records is important, but very few people only have a marijuana arrest record. If anything, their marijuana arrest record was used often to say that this was a habitual offender or someone who consistently was you know, involved in criminal activity. And so the other thing we have to do is zoom out and look more broadly. What are the ways in which you know, having a record disproportionately affects you after you've already served your time? One of the exciting things that we at DPA just launched today is an uprooting the drug war uh, report project that I will share a link to with you, um, in which we've actually seen how, and we're identifying the ways in which mass criminalization is the problem. And so it's not even just about expunging drug records. It's about thinking about the systems more broadly. Mm. Well, un undoubtedly that, that must happen, but you've still got hundreds of thousands of people in prison with a third strike, haven't you? And cannabis was the driver for that. I mean, haven't you at the very least got to, to free them? Absolutely. And so with the MORE Act, the piece of federal legislation that we're proposing, we are proposing that anyone, you know, with federal drug related or marijuana related charges be released. But we have to acknowledge that in the decades, in the most recent decades, we've actually done a pretty good job of getting most people out of the just, you know, out of incarceration. You know, to, this, to date, about 20 percent of people in, you know, in federal custody are there for a drug related charge. And this number has been going down over time. So, oh, yes. Okay. I hadn't realized. Yeah. So removing the threat of incarceration and removing drug-related charges is going to be a huge part 
of dismantling the broader, you know, ways in which the legal system is oppressing people. But ending the drug war is not going to end mass, mass incarceration, which is a bigger beast here in the United States. But it's a huge part. I don't want to minimize that. But, you know, we, we really wish you well. I'm going to I'm going to hand over for the final words to, to Alex. So Alex has you know, only relatively recently become a member of drug science and uh, he's already taken up the challenge of trying to get safe injecting rooms, or, uh, safe consumption rooms. But Alex, what advice would you give to our politicians? How, how, what should we be doing in the UK? And what, what advice would you give to drug science to be campaigning for? I think it's really interesting listening to Sheila about the subtleties and nuances that you, you come across when you start trying to change drug policy and the, all the things you need to take account of, racial injustice being a huge one, both in the USA and, and the UK. But there are some things which are fairly simple, which is that we could stop harming people for no good reason. And that's what decriminalisation does. Decriminalisation, sorry, the criminalisation of drug possession for personal use is a deliberate infliction of harm on people. It is an experience that most of us would want to avoid, all of us would want to avoid. And as Sheila says, it not only has short term, but long term consequences people, for people if they get a criminal record for drug possession. On the other side of the balance sheet, there's no good evidence that criminalisation produces any good. The argument that is placed for criminalisation by politicians and conservative commentators is that if we don't criminalising people, then drug, rock, drug use will explode. But we've seen from studies repeatedly across countries, across the places, across time, that we don't see a consistent effect of increasing drug use once the penalties for drug possession are reduced. So with criminalization of possession, we are inflicting harms, we're costing ourselves a lot of money, and we're not doing it for any good reason because it doesn't reduce drug use and it doesn't reduce drug related harms. So compared to the complexities of drug legalization, drug criminalization seems to me to be a fairly simple policy win if only we could persuade our policymakers to stop harming people for no good reason well i'm gonna look forward to working with you on that challenge over the next few years alex can i just say to, to both of you fantastic to be talking with you too we've gone on for nearly an hour and uh, we could have gone on for a lot longer but uh, congratulations on what both of what you've both, you're both doing and and particularly to you Sheila. this is a america you know for once leading the <laughs> leading the drug field in the right direction rather than the wrong one. So keep it up, keep up the good work and, and thanks to you both. Thank you. And I, I, can, I cannot at all take all this credit, take any credit, actually. I, I'd really like to credit, you know, people who use drugs in the United States who've really been pushing for this legislation and, you know, all the, you know, multitude of, of coalition partners who've really come together to really see this as a broad reaching issue. So thank you. I will relay that back. <laughs> Well, I hope they, I hope they listen, get, listen to the podcast and get that uh, thanks from you then. So bye-bye, both of you, and uh, thanks again. Thanks, David. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you. Well, that's the end of this episode of the Drug Science Podcast. Thank you for listening. But before you go, I would just like to share with you a question from our Drug Science community members. Recently, we recorded a very special podcast episode in which we invited all of our premium and philanthropic community members to ask me anything they like. Their questions were so good, I thought we should include one or two of them at the end of every podcast episode. So please enjoy this new segment of the show. Apologies for the audio quality as we recorded the session over Zoom. Hopefully they're vaguely relevant to what we've been discussing. And if you want to ask me anything, perhaps we could do an Ask David Anything Part 2. Enjoy. I'm in a very fortunate position where I've got like the next sort of 15, 20 years to do something completely different. Um, and that one needs to be something in drug science to help you know, promote and accelerate what, what's happening, all the work that you're doing, Robin, Amanda, everybody. Um, so I suppose your, your answer might help me point in that direction. I just want to get an understanding of, this sounds quite big, but the overall goal of drug science. Yeah. Is it to, you know, to, to provide sort of drug therapy to people with, certain illnesses and you know the situation or is it to legalize decriminalize and no matter what it is i mean it, it's the progression and issue of society that accepting it politicians or money or all of it so well so historically you know why we set up drug science because i was sacked from the the acmd and i had the opportunity because uh, toby jackson gave us three years funding to to set up a parallel committee and since then we've managed to keep the group going through grants and charitable donations and people like you who are community members so what we exist to tell the truth about drugs 
and it's absolutely self-evident. Even when I was when I was you know chair of the ACMD, that the ACMD couldn't tell the truth, wasn't allowed to. Now the ACMD has become a sort of you know just a, a brittle shell of it. it's just that it just basically does what the government tells it, and the government then uses it to argue for this continued sort of repression of drug users. So uh, you know we're out there to change what, but to tell the truth about drugs and 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 in order to improve basically you know, human life. So one of our big ambitions is to is to make sure that research can be done. You know, re rescheduling drugs to allow research is a critical part of our. But also we've set up this 2021 initiative to allow access. And it might be that we need to do something similar with, with psychedelics. It's, it's quite plausible that psychedelics in Britain could be turned into medicines. At the, you know, the, home, the health secretary just has to say, they're medicines. And the home office has to say, okay, then we'll move them to schedule two, like they did with cannabis. But we've been exactly the same position as well with medical cannabis. There's, you know, there aren't controlled trials. It's going to have to be prescribed on a, at, on a, you know, a per patient basis, you know, off license, etc. So drug science might end up with an, you know, maybe it's a, a 30, 21 or 20, whatever initiative for, for psychedelics in the same way as the Oregon is going down that kind of route, making the mushrooms legal so, for therapy. So yeah, so we basically need to, we're there to provide evidence and, 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 and to lobby for rational policies in terms of therapeutics. But also we want to change the whole attitude to drugs. You know, criminalizing people for personal possession of drugs is absurd. Just a complete waste of money. And it just feeds into this, or it's fed from this absurd British idea that punishing people the sadism of the of the British media and, and and many British people is just ridiculous, and they just you know they, they just like the idea of punishing people because it makes them feel better. So trying to re restore or just establish a kind of sensible balance in in the public's mind about drugs and drug policy. Yeah, and then there's another catch up some other countries. Well, indeed, it's, it's not as if there's evidence. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the but of well, course, the evidence is there. Just the will, I guess, and the. We're better at Britain than, you know, I was, don't you know that? Didn't you know we're better at Britain than everything? We can build, we can build world beating track and trace machines on our phones and we can test them on the Isle of Wight and so they don't work. You know, I mean, we're just, Britain is, you know, intellectually kind of, it's rather so far up, you know, up its own arse in some ways. But there's another th important issue and this might be, might, this might interest you. The other thing, I, the other big area that we haven't been able to achieve or move much in in the last 10 years is, is in terms of education. I mean, it's horrifying, but you probably don't know this, but the largest provider of education in schools on drugs is Scientology because they give it away. So t it's, seriously, the most of what is in schools as tools for teachers to teach about drugs is provided by Scientology, obviously on the length. And I would love to, to completely take that over and make sure, you know, have drug science as the, as the, the, the people that, you know, the organization that actually tells the truth about drugs to kids. So that's that's our sort of the third major ambition over the next few years. Thank you. So just tell me what you want to sort out and all that you do. <laughs> yeah, I will do. I may be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers.